pyramids. Hosted by Omar Sharif. Pyramids have always had a mystical hold on the mind of man. Why is this so? What is it about this shape that captures our imagination? If you look at the back of any dollar bill, there you will find a pyramid. If you go into any number of shops around the world, there you will find unusual objects, such as these. It seems obvious that the pyramid is more than just a symmetrical collection of stones. Pyramids can be found around the world, from the deserts of Egypt to the rainforests of Central America. Why were these pyramids the first things built in their respective civilizations? The dimensions of the Great Pyramid incorporate the ratio pi, a symbol used in the calculation that can give the circumference of a circle. Coincidence or intention? And finally, is it conceivable that the Great Pyramid is an astronomical observatory? Through computer analysis, Stonehenge was shown to be a highly developed measuring device for calculating the seasons. Analysis has suggested the Great Pyramid has the same function. Egypt was conceived in the shadow of these cliffs and they cradled the infant civilization as it began to mature. From these barren rocks, her people went into even bleaker desert, the borders of which have protected Egypt from invasion for countless centuries. On these dry plains, they first began to contemplate their destiny. Their dreams needed nourishment, and the Nile River fueled their ambition and brought food and life to these shores. This land has been fertile for countless generations, and one can easily imagine the ancients tilling these fields. The day-to-day -day life of these ancient Egyptians has been passed down to us through their arts. And you can almost lose yourself in these ancient scenes of daily life, human images that transcend time. Egypt soon expanded her territory, and the great pharaohs deployed their armies far and wide. Zosa, Khafre, Cheops, great men who possessed absolute power. Men who would be gods, and these living gods built for eternity. It is hard to believe that one man invented the pyramid. His name was Imhotep, the great seer and vizier of the pharaoh Tsosa. First, he began with a single layer of stones covering the tomb of his pharaoh. But Imhotep worried that robbers might break through and violate the tomb. So he added one more row of blocks and then another. This continued until he realized that he was building steps towards heaven. The first pyramid was the result. Later, Imhotep was virtually deified by the Egyptians. His creation may have been one reason. It still stands today in Saqqara, 20 kilometers south of Giza. When Tsosa was put to final rest, his head may have pointed north, towards the North Star. He lay in his tomb like some kind of ancient space traveler, poised to take a journey beyond eternity. After Imhotep's pyramid, this unique design began to appear throughout Egypt. Pyramid construction achieved the sophistication and artistry that we can only dream of. And the culmination of that skill was the Great Pyramid of Giza, constructed from stones that weighed from two to an astonishing 70 tons, 
stones that rose to the height of a 40-story building. To give an idea of the size of this great pyramid, the capital of the United States would easily stand in its shadow. And if these stones were stretched out, they would span the length of the United States from coast to coast and almost back again. How did the Egyptians do it? How was this great pyramid built? For if we assume that the pharaoh Cheops built this great pyramid, then we can safely assume it was built in the 23 years that he ruled. 23 years? Imagine. Thousands upon thousands of men working without rest day after day as Cheops' monument rose to the heavens. But though this pyramid was built as the home for, the, for a god, no god can be found within its walls today. For all trace of Cheops has vanished, his mortal remains scattered to the wind. Sad proof that though man may wish for eternity, it will ultimately elude him. Even a living god like the great pharaoh Cheops. Though immortality was their intention, History has favored two pharaohs above all others. One, because he built an incomparable monument to enshrine his memory. The other, because his treasure was discovered in our century. Now it is time for us to meet that pharaoh face to face and tell his story. His name? By the early 1920s, Egypt seemed to have been picked clean of all treasures. But two men refused to give up hope. Their lifelong love affair with Egypt was about to be consummated in a discovery that would shake the world. Howard Carter was of humble ancestry, the son of an English artist. Edward Stanhope Molnar Herbert, 5th Earl of Carnarvon, was a noble to the core, and had funded expedition after expedition for Carter, with little to show for it. But Carter persuaded Carnarvon to fund one last excursion to the sun-baked valley, for Carter sensed he was close, very close, and he was right. When Howard Carter set forth from Cairo to Luxor, he traveled south down the Nile River, a journey that took several days. He arrived at this spot, little changed since 1922. Carter's home overlooking the Valley of the Kings still stands. As we approach the area where Tut's tomb was discovered, we can well imagine what was running through Carter's mind. Was this expedition going to come up empty-handed like all the others? Carter's search went on and on. Time and money were running out. Then, an entrance to a tomb was discovered. Nearby his house, the telegraph lines still crisscrossed the sky. Lines that transmitted the message Lord Carnarvon had waited a lifetime to hear. That message read, At last have made wonderful discovery in Valley. A magnificent tomb with seals intact. Recovered same for your arrival. Congratulations, Howard Carter. That message was received right under this roof in Highclere Castle. Quickly, Lord Carnarvon made preparations to leave his ancestral home. And Carter, too, was prepared to open the tomb. These are his words. Thirty-three centuries had passed since human feet last trod the floor on which we stood. And yet the signs of recent life were around us. But when we came, to a golden shrine with doors closed and sealed, we realized that we were in the presence of the dead king. We were to witness a spectacle such as no other man in our time had been privileged to see. I carefully cut the cord, removed the precious seal, drew back the bolt, and opened the door. Carter and Carnarvon began to look around the tomb, dazzled by the riches they beheld. The outer chambers were soon emptied. As Carter first approached the inner chamber, 
His anticipation must have been incredible. He and Lord Carnarvon prepared to enter the domain of an immortal being. In attendance, an entourage of gold seemed to frown upon the interlopers. The glory that was Egypt had come to life. Carter and Carnarvon could only look with amazement. In their wildest dreams, they never could have conceived of such a treasure. When they reached their final sepulchre, they could hardly contain their excitement. Gold. A sarcophagus of pure gold blinded them. At last, the long and sometimes frustrating hunt had ended. Everywhere they looked, they saw gold. Treasure beyond definition of the word priceless. And then, in the unsteady light, they espied their recumbent form, aglow with a golden light. Cautiously, they approached the great pharaoh. For a brief moment in the life of an English lord and an American archaeologist, time lost its meaning. They looked into the face of a god. A god who once lived upon the earth, empowered by all the traditions of a great civilization. Who can say that his power could not outlast the grave? Who can be certain that this power would not awaken once disturbed? Who can say that there is no curse? Arthur Weigel, British writer and archaeologist. His death in London has revived the mystery of the curse of the pharaohs. It was in the shadow of the famous pyramids ten years ago that Weigall, as a member of Lord Carnarvon's expedition, braved the Egyptian curse to help uncover the tomb of King Tarantaman, buried for 5,000 years. None among the tourists who flocked to view the underground treasure house dreamed that of the 15 who opened it to the world, 12 would meet unnatural deaths within the short span of 10 years, most of them under mysteriously sinister circumstances. Lord Carnarvon, on the left, here with Howard Carter, American aide, died of a rare insect bite within two months after King Tut's discovery. His wife followed him in death from the same strange cause. Several committed suicide, one was murdered. Curse or coincidence? Scoff if you will, but one thing we know. In the dead king's crypt was this inscription. Death shall come with swift wings to him who toucheth the tomb of a pharaoh. The world press soon turned the curse into front page news. And it has not been far from the headlines since. While filming in the tomb, we experienced technical problems that no expert could explain. Cameras breaking, lights refusing to go on, minor problems to be sure, but problems that stopped the moment we stepped outside into the light. Are there more treasures in Egypt? Perhaps. There may be other tombs intact, other storehouses of riches waiting for discovery. Recently, Mark Lerner and I traveled to the Giza Plateau, and he was really able to bring the area alive for me. Mark, I felt somehow that we have something in common, that you were an Egyptian in some previous life. I feel that you lived before in Egypt. What do I you think? I would be honored to have been in Egypt with you before, Omar, but <laughs> I won't comment on that. I did spend a good part of this lifetime in Egypt. I've been, I lived in Egypt 13 years and spent 10 of those years doing archaeological research on the Giza Plateau. We studied the Great Sphinx for about four or five years with the American Research Center in Egypt. And for the last four years, we've been mapping the entire Giza Plateau, um, sponsored by Yale University. 
I'd like you to come along on the same journey that Mark and I took. Only in your case, you won't have to leave your chair. Well, this knoll south of the Sphinx has always been a favorite place for me. It's, as the Indians would say, it's kind of a power spot. You can sit up here and you, you can see the whole panorama of the Giza Plateau. This is probably where Cheops architects stood uh, with an eye to planning what would become one of the seven wonders of the world, the pyramid for his king. The knoll may have been a kind of command point for the Cheops building project. It overlooked the place where stones for the pyramid were quarried in the areas to the south. Tracks were used to haul the stones from the horseshoe-shaped quarry at the lower left to the plateau above. When the pyramid was complete, a long ramp or causeway spanned the distance to the valley floor. Tombs for his officials and queens completed the city of the dead. Kips' son Kefren added his own pyramid and temples to the landscape. A causeway spanned the distance to the valley floor. He had the great sphinx sculptured out of the natural rock close to the base of the plateau. Mykerinos, probably a grandson of Cheops, completed the pattern of the Giza horizon. His temples were finished by his son. Just in back of the knoll, uh, we look down upon the probable location of the workmen's settlements, um, where thousands, if not tens of thousands, of workmen had to have been settled for the building of the pyramid. Mark, there's one thing that mystifies me. I think it mystifies the whole world. Could you explain to me how these workers carried these stones up, I don't know, brought them up 450 feet up to the top of the pyramids? Well, frankly, that mystifies we experts as well. But it, they had to have used some kind of a ramp. The problem with a ramp that runs straight on to the side of the pyramid is that it would be about seven football fields in length if it had a functional slope. And every time they wanted to increase the height of the ramp, they would have to increase its length, and all the work would have to stop. Well, that would be impossible. Impossible. So my idea is that the ramp started close to the base of the pyramid, and it wrapped itself up and around the pyramid at one and one quarter turns um, to get the stones to the very top. And once they had reached the apex, they then dismantled the ramp as they went down, stage by stage, smoothing the sides of the pyramid as they went. That's a good theory, Mark. Are there any other theories about how they brought these stones up? Uh, one expert has actually suggested that they used a pulley, that they had supports on the top and a counterweight. And as the counterweight went down one side of the pyramid, the stones would go up the other side. But surely they didn't have pulleys or well, modern that's, instruments. Well, that's the problem. We, don't, we have not really found pulleys. But I we, mean, these are the tools, aren't they? These are the sort of tools they use. Yeah, these are the kinds of tools that we actually find in the debris around the bases of the pyramids. We find wooden mallets like this. And as for metal, they only had copper. And apparently, with such apparently crude tools, they <laughs> smashed the stones <laughs> into shape. I can't believe it. What's that? Well, that's a strange looking object, isn't well, it? Well, this is a particularly crude form of what's called a pounder. Um, usually they were large and made out of dolerite, and apparently one worker would hold these pounders in both hands and just smash away at the stone um, to rough it into shape. But I'm, you can imagine how many fingers must have been lost in the process. And how did they orient the, the stones. Well, they had ways of doing that too. They put down stakes with string, and we've actually found the holes, as we'll see. Um, the amazing thing is that with these crude tools, they joined three-ton blocks of stone together with a seam so fine that you can barely get a razor blade in between it. But how did they know just where to place these huge blocks? They didn't have 
surveying equipment. Well, they had their own kind of surveying equipment. They, right here you can see the holes left by the ancient surveyors where they put their stakes down to mark the line, and they measured the base of the pyramid from this line to get it accurately. My God, they're still there after all this time. Yeah, and there are other traces left on the floor around the pyramids too, like these cubes, this grid, which was left by the ancient quarrymen as they worked the surface of the plateau down to make the base of the Kefren Pyramid. They channeled, and then they cut off the uh, humps that were left from the channeling, and that way they worked the stone down. That looks like quite the climb. It is. We're going to the top of the Kefren Pyramid, the second one at Giza. Well, I'm sitting on the casing, which was once snow white, so you can imagine how the sun looked on it when it was brand new. It must have been blinding out there. It's a sheer drop. Can you imagine thousands of workmen up here, day after day? It's incredible, absolutely incredible. Down there, you see the valley temple where the pharaoh was embalmed, and the long ramp or causeway, which had walls and a roof, so it was like a long, dark tunnel, coming up the plateau to the funeral temple, where they probably recited chants similar to the Book of the Dead over the king's mummy. Now modern Cairo is expanding all around the pyramids and threatening the Sphinx with the pollution. It seems that the city of Cairo is rapidly closing in on the Giza Plateau. And if we are not careful, we may lose these monuments. Mark, can anything be done? Well, our good friend Zahi Hawass, the director of the Giza Plateau, and the Egyptian authorities are looking at a plan to make the Giza Plateau a kind of national park which would restrict access to the area. And there are a great deal of measures that they are discussing. Hopefully, these will preserve the plateau for future generations. Yes, I think it's time we did something about mm. that plateau. The Sphinx. Its enigmatic smile may conceal a storehouse of information that might help us to finally solve the riddle of the pyramids. We must journey there now. There is an age-old legend that the Sphinx guards hidden knowledge of a subterranean tomb, a temple, or a hall of records of a lost civilization. In its various forms, the mythical tale can be traced back to early Arabs, Christians, back to the Romans or the Greeks, and even back to pharaonic times. The Sphinx is the symbol of eternal mystery. Like the Great Pyramid, there are things we know about the Sphinx, and yet it still remains surrounded by tantalizing mysteries. You see, in the time of Tutankhamun, the Sphinx was already 1,200 years old, and it was Tutankhamun's great-grandfather, the pharaoh Tutmos IV, who was first to restore the crumbling man-beast. He told us so in the first archaeological record ever written about the Sphinx. This granite stella, weighing more than five tons. Tutmos was a royal prince, but not in line for the throne. While on a hunting party, he fell asleep between the paws of the great cat, which in those days was buried up to its neck in sand. The Sphinx appeared to the prince in a dream. My son, deliver me of the sand, and I will make you king of Egypt. And then the text breaks off. But Tutmos did become king. Now, what did he find in his excavations of the Sphinx 3,400 years ago? Well, look to the stella. The Sphinx sits on a platform with a door at the bottom. Could this be a hint to the entrance of the legendary Hall of Records? 
The Sphinx was finally excavated down to the bedrock floor in 1926. No pedestal was found. Experts scoffed at the notion of a secret passage in the Sphinx. But something was missed. A passage was found under the rump of the statue. It had been resealed under the stone skin of the Sphinx and forgotten by all, except one of the boys who worked at that excavation. Sixty years later, that boy was an overseer of workmen for antiquities, Muhammad Abdel Mawgud. In 1980, he pointed out the exact location of the passage to Zahi Hawass and Mark Lerner. It was found exactly as the old man had remembered. Today, we know of two passages, one going down into the Sphinx and one going up. At the moment, Mark Lerner is going down along the passage where cameras have never been admitted until now. This upper passage is blocked because of the restoration stones placed by Tutankhamun's great-grandfather. Is the passage from an even earlier time? These footholds were the ones carved by the ancient workmen as they formed this passage into the body of the Sphinx. Where they were going with this thing is a good question. What were they looking for? Were they making this as a tomb to bury somebody under such a sacred spot? We're not really sure. But as I say, it is a long-standing tradition, maybe going back to ancient Egypt itself, that the Sphinx hides some kind of a secret passage. The passage in the rear of the Sphinx proved to be a dead end. But there are hints of others. Sonars recently used by different American, French, and Japanese teams indicate something, some mysterious cavity here just under that enigmatic stone box built against the shoulder of the Sphinx. Why is this box here? The equinox sunset strikes over this box and into the sanctuary of the Sun Temple. There may have once been a colossal statue of Osiris, which stood upon the box. Osiris was the lord of the underworld. Did the builders of the Sphinx leave us a clue? Did they carve a symbolic underworld? A secret cavern near or even under the Sphinx? The secret passages within the Great Pyramid were first discovered in 820 AD by a caliph. His name was Abdullah al Ma'mun. Mark recently went on expedition to some of the rarely seen inner chambers, and we took our cameras along. Let's go with him now. It goes all the way to the bottom of the Cheops pyramid, down into the bowels of the bedrock. It is a long, hot, and slow walk to get into the interior of this 40-story pyramid. And as this map indicates, the pyramid is honeycombed with passageways. It was obviously not the intention of the pyramid's builders to make it easy for casual visitors to get inside. This is the uh, so-called well, or the robber's hole goes up to the Grand Gallery, blasted through the core of the pyramid. It may be where the uh, people escaped who closed the king's chamber up in the pyramid. You see these footholds, they may have climbed down through them. Yeah, I went up there once, and it's pretty hairy. One slip, and you slide all the way back down, and you end up here at the bottom. What a great view of the robber's hole. We made it. This is the bottom chamber, the very core of the pyramid, the absolute bottom. The workmen never finished cutting this chamber out of the solid rock. These 
mounds of rock or what are left when the king came down one day and said, put down your tools, I want to be buried higher up in the pyramid. And since he was the living God, they had to do what he said. And so, as the story goes, they built another chamber for the king, higher up in the pyramid, the one that's mistakenly called the Queen's Chamber. It was made out of limestone with a pented roof and this marvelous niche for the king's statue. They almost had it completed. They only had to smooth down the floors and the walls. And then they think the king came along one day and said, yeah, I don't like it. Let's have it higher up in the pyramid. And so once again, they had to put down their tools and they built the king's chamber, the highest. It had a marvelous grand gallery leading up to it. It was encased with red granite brought all the way from Aswan, 500 miles downstream. Finally, the king was satisfied and that is where they think Cheops was laid to rest, inside his pyramid. Above the king's vault, we see chambers above chambers above chambers. It's thought that they relieve the tremendous weight upon the king's burial. I'm in this crawl space that was carved from the top of the grand gallery to the first of the five chambers above the king's chamber, apparently done by the workmen after the top of the king's chamber and the top of the pyramid had been closed off. It's thought they had to get to that first chamber above the king's chamber and the floor on top of it because earthquakes or something had caused the ceiling blocks to crack. And they may have wanted to get in here to inspect and possibly to repair with plaster. Through this cramped entrance, we emerge into one of the chambers. discover walls inscribed with ancient and modern graffiti. This is one of the names of the work gangs. It reads, how powerful is the great white crown of Cheops gang? They put their names on the blocks because they were responsible for moving it. And there was competition between them to get them into place. We are almost at the top now. A good place to stop and rest for we are right on the edge of making the most fascinating discovery. This is one of the original leveling lines of the chamber. And you can see that the, the leveling line has been put on um, after the blocks are put into place. Before they were put into place, the workmen put this cartouche of the king, which is underneath the line. And that's part of the name of one of the work gangs. These channels in the top of the granite blocks indicate how they were working the block down from the top. You channel, leave a hump, take away the hump, and gradually work the surface away. Well, as massive as these structures are, people are worried that they might collapse. Uh, last year, engineers were in here, and they put up these seals to see if the chamber is slipping at all. If the seal is cracked, of course, it means there's slippage in the ceiling blocks. All these ceilings, all these rooms show cracks running through the 80-ton granite blocks. There's been slippage at some time. Is it still happening? Okay, I got to bottom. Now, the right foot is going to have to come down a lot. Put the line up. So you... Let me take a look here. Okay. See what I mean? Up here at the far end of the uppermost of the five chambers, you have what really clenches the Great Pyramid for Cheops. It's his name written in red ink on one of the stones, left by the workman who dragged it into place. And it clearly spells out Kha U F U, Khufu, the ancient Egyptian name of Cheops. This has never been seen on film before. Life in ancient Egypt was but a prelude to afterlife. And because that afterlife was eternal, nothing was left to chance. Before a body could journey to the land of Osiris, the keeper of the underworld, it had first to be prepared. When an Egyptian died, his body was readied for this journey, a process that took 70 days. 
First, the body was soaked in a salt solution that absorbed all moisture. And then the vital organs were removed and placed in canopic jars. The brain was liquefied and removed through the nostrils. But the heart, the heart was kept intact. For they believed that it was the center of knowledge. And when the priest was finished, they had transformed the human being into something they thought was eternal, something called a mummy. One night, I came face to face with the debris of death. My guide and I went into a bone house, a storage shed for the ages. Inside that bone house, I looked into the empty eyes of an ancient Egyptian. When I asked my guide how old this skull was, he answered, 5,000 years. Imagine, 5,000 years. We went into another room, and in the corner, almost hidden in a bed of straw, were the remains of a mummy, lost in the shadows, after most of the ancient bones had been moved elsewhere. It's incredible. It's incredible to be holding a bone that's 5,000 years old. This was part of a human being. It, it looks so... It could be somebody's bone of yesterday. I can't believe it. My hand is shaking. <laughs> I mean, it's so exciting. Ah, Bella. How, how fragile we are, really, because, I mean, these are bones, we have bones like these, exactly like this. And this looks extremely fragile, but there it is, 5,000 years old. It's not reduced into dust or anything like that. I would have thought they would be reduced to dust. There it is, probably exactly like the one I have in my own body. We have no need to fear. Their ghosts do not haunt these bones. These are the people found in the labyrinths around the Great Pyramid. There was no earlier civilization. The skulls have no antenna. These were not extraterrestrials descending on Earth from a strange planet in space. These are the skulls of Egyptians who lived 5,000 years ago, courtiers mistresses, architects, officials, making up the royal court of Cheops. This is the chapel of the lovely Merisank, Cheops' granddaughter. She became queen in her own right when she married her half-brother, Kefra. Yes. And we even know the preferred woman's figure 5,000 years ago. Tall, slender. Mm. Below the Giza Plateau, a maze can be found. A maze in the form of tunnels that twist and turn and seemingly never end. And Mark Lehner is one of the few people who know where those paths turn. For one is never sure what is just around the corner. A wall, a passage, or an empty sarcophagus. There's a lot of charcoal in there, a lot of charred bone. It looks like there's uh, clearly been a fire in the sarcophagus. Sometimes, uh, the remains, the mortal remains of the deceased were burned so that they couldn't attack the uh, plunders as they robbed the tomb. When you are alone in this eternal night, you feel the weight of the centuries pressing down upon your shoulders. It takes a brave or perhaps foolhardy person to 
penetrate deeper. Through this narrow passageway, we enter the secret chamber where the life of Egypt is on display. On the walls of Merisang's tomb, murals were painted depicting everyday life so that these activities could nourish the souls in their afterlife. This is a city of the dead, a necropolis inhabited by ghosts. One can almost sense them, feel them, as they whisper and taunt us with the secrets they possess. Mummies have come to symbolize the mysterious, the ageless, the fantastic. They were the means by which Egyptians hoped to transcend their material body a word that means something that decays. When they placed themselves within this bedrock, it was as if they planted a seed, a seed that would germinate and then flower, as the mummy's soul came forth from the underworld. virtual labyrinth down here. This goes to yet another tomb chamber, and in that chamber there's another shaft going down several meters. There's another chamber at the bottom of that that seems to go on forever. In this case lies one of the most perfectly preserved mummies in all Egypt. We even know his name, Nefer. This mummy was literally pickled and then reconstructed in the image of the living human being. Almost a statue molded out of bandages. As we look into Nefer's eyes, staring into the darkness, it seems for this Egyptian at least, that DK has won the battle against immortality. They honeycombed the whole plateau, putting themselves away for eternity. Perhaps in a portion of the heavens reserved for the ancient Egyptians, the former inhabitants of these empty husks are in the embrace of Osiris, living their promised afterlife. If they are, they may well be displeased at the way their earthly remains have been treated for their disturbance is almost like a wound in time. This might explain what happened one night in 1938, almost 150 years ago to the day. A stone sarcophagus was taken from the pyramid of Michelinos, that's the smallest one, and loaded upon a ship called the Beatrice. That ship set sail for Great Britain and promptly vanished off the coast of Portugal. Perhaps somewhere in the heavens, an ancient face displayed an icy smile. The ancient Egyptians believed that the Great Pyramid of Giza anchored the center of the world. They felt that all of the continents and all of the works of men radiated out of this central spot. And in the mythical heart of this powerful spot, in the center of the Great Pyramid itself, is the king's chamber, the inner sanctum of Cheops, the heart of the world. The pharaoh wielded absolute power during his life as a man. He achieved immortality as a god after his death. 
Now this grand gallery is aimed right at the heart of the pyramid. It leads to the focus of the whole Giza necropolis, the inner sanctum of the king's tomb. It appears that the king changed his mind several times during the construction. Being the supreme power and the living god, he moved higher and higher. But it all started in the bottom of this stone mausoleum. sanctum of the royal grave it's incredible I'm here for the first time with you now while his soul was glorified far beyond the horizons of mere mortals Cheops's body was left behind in this granite sarcophagus now it is cold and empty. But when it held the royal remains, the sarcophagus was called by the Egyptians, the Lord of Life. It was for them like a nuclear power core that energized the pyramid, the temple, and indeed the whole of Egypt. Dr. Hawass, please tell me, who was this man who was worshipped like a god? What do we know about him? What did he look like? This is the only small statuette that ever found for this great king. And even is not found at Giza, it's found in a site in Upper Egypt called Abydos. Again, we are left with mystery. The clues point to Cheops as the builder of the pyramid, but the feeling for his presence is fainter than any ghost could ever be. What we do know is that this inner sanctum and its empty sarcophagus speak to us of resurrection, the renewal and uplifting of the human soul. There is but one thing that we do know about him, and we will always know it for a long time to come. He is responsible for the seventh wonder of the world, the Pyramid of Giza. This ancient nation's greatest legacy to all of us is not the search for treasure, nor the gold of the child pharaoh Tutankhamun, nor the extraordinary architectural achievement of the legendary Cheops, but the fact that the spirit never dies. This is not just a monument to one great king. The people who built these pyramids gave their lives in order to prolong the life of the soul of a man. If he could speak, what would he say to us? Would he tell us of kings and gods, of scribes and architects, of a river that spanned the world, of the light of knowledge that burned hotter than the sun? Or would his tale be a humble one of the calluses on his hands, the bruises on his body, the cloak of weariness that would descend upon his shoulders each evening as he returned home beneath the shadow of the unfinished pyramid? What would he say to us? To all of you watching, thank you for accompanying me on my journey. It has been more than a journey across space. We have gone beyond time itself. 
The pyramids are only the most visible mystery of ancient Egypt. For we not only don't know all the answers about these magnificent people, but we probably don't even know what questions we should ask. So perhaps all of you might reflect upon this affirmation of mankind's ability to at least fight eternity to a draw. For the pyramids are the closest thing to eternal that we are ever likely to create.